guess I'm ready to go live. Welcome, WKIM Media Network, and I am your host, Marsha Jews, and we have a full night ahead. We're a little bit behind because we've got stuff that always interfered. You know, when all that negativity comes around, it starts because we're doing something good, and that's how we roll. And thank you all for joining us. And thank all of you who stuck around and found out that we're still here, right? And we're still standing. So what I'd like to do is introduce Zamoria Brandon, who is the chair of the 2023 Shine the Light on Sickle Cell. And she is amazing. I'm not going to go through her resume, but I'm going to tell you, you've got to get our newsletter because it's all in there. And all of y'all know it anyway. So Zamoria, let's talk about sickle cell anemia and what you all are doing and how you're fighting it in the Philadelphia, Delaware Valley chapter of the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Marsha. Thank you. I, I love your uh, the title of your platform, We Keep It Moving, because even though there were some challenges, we stayed the course, we went out, we came back in, we tried another link, we went out, we came back in, and we're all here. So again, we wanna thank you. And thanks Stephen Rivelis, who was the one that yeah. connected us with you. Uh, he is the consultant for uh, Synergy for Shine the Light. So we want to introduce and let you know who is here this evening. It is, uh, there are five of us now, four women, from different parts of uh, two of us from Pitts, uh, one from Pittsburgh, I'm from Philadelphia, one from Maryland, and one from the DC area. So I'm Zamoria Brandon, as Marcia said, chair of the 2023 Shine the Light on Sickle Cell. This is a big initiative we're gonna talk about. I'm also the administrator for the Philadelphia Delaware Valley chapter of the Sickle Cell Disease Association. It is my pleasure, my honor, to be here this evening with Marsha and all my sisters from across the region. So I'm gonna turn it over to Barbara Harrison. <laughs> Guys, so good evening, everyone. Uh, so yes, I'm Barbara Harrison. I'm a genetic counselor, um, work at Howard University and um, have always appreciated um, also working with our Howard University Center for Sickle Cell Disease. So specifically, I work with community outreach and education. Um, and so we certainly have been providing clinical services, outreach services, screening services um, to the Washington DC area and beyond um, for over 40 years. And then um, I also have the, the pleasure and honor of working with the Sickle Cell community organization who's also local here to the DC Maryland area called the Sickle Cell Association of the National Capital Area. And so together, you know, we're really just trying to spread this word and increase the awareness about sickle cell disease, sickle cell trait, the importance of knowing your status, um, and also just trying to uplift and help those uh, of our brothers and sisters who have sickle cell disease. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it on to Tanika Hoffman. Hello. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Tanika Hoffman. I am the executive director and founder of the Sickle Cell Coalition of Maryland. I am also sitting on the Maryland Sickle Cell State Steering Committee. I am a community health worker. I have my master's in international development. Um, I also own a nonprofit in Thailand, um, which I won't really get into, but I own an NGO overseas and I also have sickle cell disease and I'm happy to be here and participate. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Matthews and I am the founder of Children's Sickle Cell Foundation here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I am the Synergy CBO um, lead for data collection and the former lead for the Synergy Project ECHO. Um, and I wear many hats. Um, one is facilitating the Pennsylvania Sickle Cell Providers Network. And um, I am a mom of a sickle cell warrior who is living well with sickle cell. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Marsha, did you want to ask it any questions or anything? You need to unmute yourself. Unmute. Unmute. Yeah. You know, I got most talkative, so I talk whether it's on or off. It doesn't matter. <laughs> when I was in high school. <laughs> so, 
sickle cell, um, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter, my, my daughter just called me. She's in Texas on a new job. Um, my sister, Sherry Jean, passed. She had sickle cell anemia mm. and it, it wasn't um, a pretty sight at all. And so it's very important that we're here. And so many people of color are really battling that program. And so I think this is really wonderful to see the work that you're doing in Pennsylvania. And hopefully we can see that happen and this at this level, because this is a big program you all have created. And you've made this massive commitment to affect change. Let's talk about what people who are our listeners, what should they be doing? How do you know when you receive or when someone in your family contracts sickle cell? How, can you talk about sickle cell anemia and, and how it works and how it takes over? Uh, certainly. But what I would like to do as we move into that conversation or that part of the conversation is to talk about how we all came together, that we fall under the umbrella of an organization. It's with the William E. Proudford Foundation and its Synergy, which stands for Sickle Cell Improvement Across the Northeast Region Through Education. And so we're all a part of the Synergy Initiative and under that initiative, which started um, many, many years ago, but under that initiative, we have something called Shine the Light on Sickle Cell. And the purpose of that is to raise awareness, to bring people together, but also to focus in on bringing forth a universal cure. So Shine the Light started out as a Northeast collaborative with all the areas uh, in this Northeast region, and it has spread not only nationally in recognition of World Sickle Cell Awareness Day, but also across the globe. We actually have um, 29, 21 countries from last year that were involved with Shine the Light. We had 29 states plus the District of Columbia and the Virgin Islands. We had 223 events. We had 149 organizations and 12.2 thousand tweet impressions and 988 meta followers. So I'm, I'm going back to this because this is kind of like the foundation of raising sickle cell awareness through Shine the Light in recognition of World Sickle Cell Awareness Day. Now you asked the question about how is it that people find out? How is it they know? We can all talk about that. Maybe we could ask Tanique since she is a sickle cell warrior how did she find out? You know, at what age did she find out? Did she find out at birth? Can you speak about that, Tanique? Hi. So, yeah, and it's Tanika. Um, I am an 80s baby. So, depending on where you live in the United States and what state you were in, you may, may, may have been tested for sickle cell um, disease or sickle cell trait. Um, but in my case, because I was born in the 80s, I was missed. So I was not diagnosed with sickle cell disease until I was two years old. I was about to have a procedure at Children's National. And as many people know, and some might know, right before you have surgery, it is important for you to have a blood transfusion or blood exchange. The purpose of this is getting your sickle cells count down. Um, that basically means taking that little sickle shape and having more blood that are that is donut shaped through a, a donor donating blood. Um, and so I was diagnosed at the age of two years old. But in the United States, all children are now tested for sickle cell disease and all of the other hemoglobin apathies under the umbrella of sickle cell disease, which includes sickle cell anemia, sickle cell SC to C disease, sickle cell beta thalassemia plus and minus, sickle cell Arab, and sickle cell SE disease, because there are different types of sickle cell disease known as genotypes. Sickle cell anemia is the most prominent genotype um, that affects one in every 365 
have African American births. And for individuals who come from the Hispanic and Latino community, it's 16,800 in every, um, in every birth. And so my generation and kids born in the 80s and 90s might, might have not been diagnosed at birth and may have found out just depending on where they live in different times of their lives. But yes, unfortunately, I was missed as a child and it just has to deal with the time that I was born. Um, as of 2006, every state tests for sickle cell disease now. That's right. Mm -hmm. Every state. Um, I would like to ask Andrea if she would speak as a parent who has a 23-year-old with sickle cell, um, what happened when he was born? You know, what did you know and all of that? Sure. Um, so we found out through newborn screening that um, my son, the, her son had sickle cell and we were quite surprised because we didn't know my husband had trait. So we were caught off guard and we went through just learning everything we could about sickle cell disease in a very short period of time. It was, um, it was devastating news at first because it was shocking. We didn't know enough about it to know that you can live well with sickle cell, that you can, um, that there are treatments back then, the treatment that um, we were given, he was, by the time he was six years old, he, he was on a very um, hard course, very severe course um, with sickle cell. And we knew that something needed to be done. He needed some, some support, some form of treatment. So we opted in for hydroxyurea, which at that time wasn't FDA approved, but we were on a study. And thank God that we were able to get on it because he is now living well with sickle cell and he has had very few pain crises since he was six. Before turning six, he had many crises. We basically lived in the hospital. It was unbelievably difficult to work and spend six days on average in the hospital with him four or five times a year. And some people go even more than that. So it was a very challenging uh, six years. But at, once he started hydroxyurea, those crises went way down and he didn't have a crisis for seven years. And then he had a crisis at about 13. And then um, he has been, you know, periodically having crisis, but not quite as much as he would have. He was definitely on a severe course and we're just thankful for some of the medications. We actually wanted to give him a bone marrow transplant because he had three full siblings and he wasn't eligible for a transplant because none of his full siblings matched. So that was kind of devastating as well. But um, we do know that there are now three additional FDA approved drugs available. And if you you know are interested in learning more about that, please talk to your doctor, ask, uh, ask them for the new treatments and information on those um, because we're still waiting for a new drug to cure. There are people who have been cured um, of sickle cell anemia, but that is the few and the few that happen to have a, a good match um, for bone marrow transplant and have opted in to do that. Um, so we wanted that to be an option for him and it just wasn't. So we're still waiting for universal cure and raising awareness um, through Shine the Light and other efforts during um, June. And of course, every day, we live with it every day. And um, with the thought of you know, possibly losing him, that it's still there. So it's, it's hard to live. Um, thinking that at some point, you know, the cure might not come in time for him, but we just live optimal, you know, with the most positive outlook that we're going to live and do everything we can living well with sickle cell until that cure comes that they can, um, you know, everyone can have it and everyone has access to it and everyone can afford it. Mm -hmm. So that's why we work to raise awareness and raise funds for sickle cell research and for sickle cell disease. Right. I just want to give a contrast to what Tanika and Andrea have said about um, being born with it when the children were diagnosed. So I was married for 25 years. My husband had sickle cell disease. He was born in 1938. He wasn't diagnosed until he was nine years old because they thought he had rheumatoid arthritis. So that, and then the parents were not aware of their status. So he was born, uh, diagnosed at nine, and then he had a, a twin sisters that were born, and they had the disease. And then he had a, a younger brother that was born. All four had sickle cell disease. 
this was 1938 to 1940 something that um and i'm just i'm contrasting that because of what you're talking about now to see we have we have a long way to go but we still have come a long way so i just wanted to share that uh just to show you that contrast so sure. marcia does that answer your question well, one of the other things I'd like Barbara to talk about is, um, is, is she asked how you get it. You don't contract it, but can you talk a little bit about the genetics of getting um, yeah. of having a child with sickle cell disease so we can clarify that point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So um, so sickle cell disease is the most common genetic disorder. And so what that means is that it's due to a change in the information, basically in the instructions that tell our bodies how to operate. And that's what we call our genetic information. And that genetic information comes in many different varieties. If you think of something like eye color, you know, we know some people have blue eyes and some have brown eyes and some have green eyes. So for all of our genetic information, we are a beautiful mix of diversity of information. But sometimes that information just doesn't work quite like we expect it to. Um, and so that's the, what is the case is with sickle cell disease. So it's a, a caused by a different type of what we call hemoglobin. And I certainly don't want to get into that complete level of detail here. But just to explain that, you know, there's some types of hemoglobin that work very well, different variations of it, but this particular variation, um, those it causes those cells to take that sickle shape that uh, Tanika had mentioned before. And so, um, in order for a person to actually have sickle cell disease, they have to inherit that genetic information that causes it from both parents. So they get it from their mother and the father. So this is one of those cases where, you know, sometimes I'll be talking to families and they'll say, oh, it came from mom's side or oh, it came from dad's side. And, you know, that's really not the case here. And and we don't control the genes that we have or the genes that we pass on. So in any case, you get it from both parents and you'll have sickle cell disease. If you only get it from one parent, then you have what we call sickle cell trait. And and typically people with sickle cell trait are healthy and often don't know they have trait until they actually get tested. And that's the importance of screening. Um, although we do know that some people with sickle cell trait do have some medical um, complications as a result of it. Um, but I think one thing that um, Zamoria just so, you know, great, very, you know, pointed out in a very well way and explaining the situation with her husband and, and versus that, um, that happened with Tanika and, and Miss Andrea is that, advocacy is what caused that change. Advocacy is what caused, um, you know, newborn screening to include sickle cell disease. And it happened at a time, you know, through the civil rights movement, um, through the, the work of legends that, you know, we could spend hours talking about. Um, but my point is that that advocacy, people coming together is what made that happen. And that's what's going to propel us into the future. And that's what makes efforts like Synergy so important. You know, in essence, Synergy is a way for all of these sickle Sickle cell community-based organizations to come together and identify some joint needs that we all have, that all of us are facing in all of our states and the whole region. And one of them that we pointed out was awareness. It just wasn't enough awareness about sickle cell. It wasn't enough attention to it. And that's what got us to shine the light. Um, Zamori and her, her um, had a partner in crime at the time. It's Gloria, Gloria Rochester, right? Yes, was the okay. one who was, was the you one know, that brought that yeah that, that really that was to it mm -hmm, yeah that brought this brainchild of you know why can we not use World Sickle Cell Day as a time to shine this light on sickle cell. Um, and so there are a variety of programs that are going on in the various states. And you, Ms. Marsh, you talk about you know what's that action that we want folks to pack? What is that, you know, what is that move that we want people to take? We want you to find out what is going on in your state, in your local area, down the street that's going on about sickle cell and be a part of it. If it's a walk, if it's a, um, a community event, if it's a blood drive, we need you to get involved and we need you to be, you know, more aware of what sickle cell disease is, how it affects the people in your community I don't know what's and happening. what we can do to make it better. Sure. Yes. Um, and when you, can you all hear me? And when yes, you see red, oh, okay. I can definitely hear you. Okay, okay. Uh, Barbara, would you also talk about who sickle cell impacts? Because that's a mm, big thing. Sure, sure. Yeah. So um, so sickle cell disease, the uh, people who have trait for it actually have a protection against malaria where they don't get that infection as as 
um, easily or typically as badly. And so in places where malaria is quite prevalent, you will find variations in this hemoglobin, which includes sickle cell disease. And so, um, so sickle cell is really prominent in, among individuals on the African continent, um, as well as around the Mediterranean and Greece and Italy, even in India, Saudi Arabia, there's different variations of sickle cell and different variations of types of hemoglobin that we'll see in those areas because they provide that protection. Now, through the transatlantic slave trade, that's what really brought sickle cell disease to the United States. And so, um, so in the United States, it's primarily a disease that tends to affect people um, that we would identify as being Black. But it's really, really important for us to understand that genes don't follow a skin color. Genes follow eggs and sperm and where they go. And we know that there's been a lot of mixture around that um, for a variety of reasons, some of which were not, of course, all um, by choice. But regardless, um, the point is that um, in the United States, as you know, Tanika had said earlier, you have one in 350 births of individuals um, that, again, identify themselves as being African-American, as being affected with sickle cell disease. But that's really a social construct. There's no biology that says you're African-American, that you're Black, or that you're white. Um, and so that's why it comes down to being tested. Um, that's why you can't make assumptions. And you also can't make Make assumptions of, you know, it's not in my family, so I must not have trait. You know, trait can be passed down from generation to generation, no one be affected. And then, you know, those two people get together and then there's that possibility it still doesn't happen, but then it can and then you see it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can I interject um, for a second to talk about, um, okay, I, I don't know what my trait status is. How do I go about finding out what my trait status is. Um, there are several ways that you can do so. The first way is through the American Red Cross, you can donate blood. And right. when you donate blood, and if, you're, uh, if you identify as Black or African-American or Afro-Caribbean, they will tell you your sickle cell trait status. So you'll get to donate blood and help sickle cell patients and moms who give birth and might hemorrhage and need blood. And then you also find out if you have sickle cell trait. And in addition to that, your blood will be tagged, and it's called a blue tag. And those blood products will be put away specifically for sickle cell warriors if it is a good match for that particular patient. So that's that's the first way you can find out if you have sickle cell trait. American Red Cross does not test for other hemoglobin apathies such as S, um, sickle cell, sorry, such as C trait or D trait or thalassemia, but you can mm -hmm. find out um, what your S trait is. Another thing that you could do is reach out to your primary care provider and ask for electrophoresis um, to find out if you have sickle cell trait. And then you can also um, ask for a HPLC. Additionally, one of the cool things that I've done, and a lot of people don't think of it from this perspective, is if you buy like 23andMe and you do your uh, genetic ancestry and you um, check, hey, I want to find out, you know, my genes, they'll actually send you a report, 23andMe, and it'll tell you if you have sickle cell trait or sickle cell C trait, I mean, or C trait or whatever, you know, hemoglobinopathy trait, and then it explains why you have it um, and where it comes from. So there are several ways where you can reach out and find out if you have sickle cell trait or C trait or D trait um, through those channels. Mm -hmm. And that's very important what Tanika is saying, because in light of the fact that one out of every 12 African Americans is a trait carrier, and typically there are no symptoms, mm -hmm. so you would not know your status unless you specifically ask to be tested. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, with HIV or AIDS, you say, do you know your status? The same thing in the sickle cell community, do you know your status? Mm -hmm. It's very important. And so most people's introduction to the world of sickle cell is when a child is born, like Andrea said, that she didn't know, her husband didn't know that he had the trait. And so therefore two trait carriers got together and there was this 25% chance that this child would be born with the disease and that happened in her family. So knowing your status, you know, I don't care how old you are, you can go <laughs> and get tested just to find out because maybe you don't, you don't have it, but someone in the family, maybe even further back has it and you would never know unless you ask to be tested for this. So it's very important. And Tanika talked about being screened at the blood drives now. This is happening all over 
not just in specific areas where you can be screened, you know your trade status, but also a lot of people don't know their blood type. And you can find out your blood type when you donate blood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, and I want to um, just, you know, add in from my, you know, genetics perspective, I guess. Um, so certainly if you are, you know, you really are um, concerned from a reproductive standpoint, I really do in, in encourage you if sickle cell disease is something that you're concerned about, if it's something you want to know more information about, to ensure that you get your testing through your physician. Because as, you know, Tanika has said, but I just really want to emphasize, the testing through the Red Cross is really just a screen. It's really just looking for one type. And that's as well true for 23andMe and those other testing. So, you know, it's fine and it's kind of good for those, you know, not quite entertainment purposes, but, you know, kind of that first level or first tier. But if, you know, it's really something you're trying to make um, reproductive decisions around, or if you have some, you know, concerns about your health or something that's going on with your health, I really do encourage you to, to go to your physician and get that second test that she mentioned, which is that hemoglobin electrophoresis or HPLC. And you're, you know, you don't even have to know that. If you ask your right. doctor for a sickle cell test, that's the mm-hmm. test they certainly should, mm-hmm. should That's offer. a confirmatory test. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. we want to make sure that people are walking around with the correct information, not partial information and mm-hmm. thinking they were tested and that, you know, they really don't have that whole full complete information. So mm-hmm. it's one yeah. of, the of that. It's very important. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is Marsha still there? <laughs> well, we can continue talking. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So I think a great um, topic that Tanika brought up was blood. Um, you know, blood donation is so important. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that all of our organizations here have sponsored blood drives. Um, what are some of the things that y'all have heard about why people don't want to donate blood or maybe have a hesitancy and and what have been your responses? So within, you know, our community, the black community, we have a fraught history with medical providers, with being experimented on, uh, with being discriminated against um, when seeking care. And because of that, people are afraid um, to donate blood, even if it's with a reputable institution like the American Red Cross. I remember a blood drive that I threw last year for Sickle Cell Awareness Month, and one of the gentlemen came in, and as he was about to register, he came to me. He said, oh, I was, I'm was i so scared to give blood. I heard that you all were, like, taking blood for experiments. Like, he literally said this, and it was, like, a young man, like, so you know, the community in our area, the DC area found out that we were having a blood drive and people started talking and we were able to have a successful turnout, but there is still so much fear um, and stigma within the black community. And we have to work together to let them know as far as donating blood, that it's safe and it's okay. And, you know, the people who are planning these events live with the illness and, you know, the Red Cross touches my life very much. So anytime I need a blood transfusion, anytime I need a blood exchange, anytime I'm about to go and have surgery and need blood, you know, to suppress my S count so I won't die when I'm being cut open. You know, that is so important. For example, my blood exchange that most patients get blood exchanges when, you know, they have had a stroke or might be prone to stroke. And this is a process that happens every four to six weeks. And for individuals like myself, that means anywhere between nine to 13 units of blood every single month, then multiply that by how many sickle cell patients are receiving blood exchanges. And that will help you understand that the need to donate blood is so important. When we don't have access to blood, we could literally lose our lives, you know, waiting for the blood bank to get that specific blood that's unique to sickle cell, because it's not just like, oh, let me just receive blood from anyone. When you have sickle cell disease, you have to be cross match accordingly. And there's other things like antigens and antibodies that has to be looked at before the blood even makes it to us. And so it's so important for those in the black, brown, BIPOC community to donate because my life depends on your generosity. Mm -hmm. And I want to follow up with what you're sharing because two weeks ago, um, we received a phone call from a father whose son was in the hospital and uh, he called in a panic to say, He is in need of a blood transfusion, but they don't have his type. 
And wow. he is, and I said, well, what is his type? O negative, which is a universal type for blood. They did not have it at a major hospital in Philadelphia. Of course, I won't name it, but they had to reach out to a, a blood bank or somewhere. But this young man went for quite a while without getting that transfusion. Eventually they were able to, and that just blew my mind because I said, what it, now, o, o negative, O is the universal blood type. And if they did not have this blood type, I mean, just think about it. Not enough people are donating blood. And eventually he did get transfused and all of that, but that really put me and our organization on notice like, oh my God, never had a phone call like that before. You know, we've heard about blood shortages across the country, but this was real. So we really do need people to consider donating blood. And Barbara, you asked the question, what I hear all the time is, I don't like needles. Mm. And then I respond by saying, but a child or a person with sickle cell disease, can you imagine if they have to be transfused, how many needles they will receive? Think about a child. And so when they, when I say that to them, they're like, oh, I never thought about it like that. Mm -hmm. you know? Here's something I want to tell people. So I have a port. I don't know if you can see it. When sickle cell patients get blood um, exchanges, um, our needles are 32 inches. They're thick. And it is the most painful needle that you'll ever, ever feel. And it's two needles because they need to pull blood out and then return blood. And so mm -hmm. a five-year-old, a 10-year-old, myself, a 23-year-old, we're getting these thick needles put in our chest. Or sometimes patients don't have a port and they have to get a needle in their neck to get their blood exchange, a catheter to pull out um, the blood. So... That tiny little needle that you're get, you, you'll get to donate blood um, is no comparison to the thick, boorish needle um, that we uh, receive when we're getting our blood exchanges so that, you know, the machine can appropriately move our sickle cells out and give us donors blood. Mm -hmm. It's very thick. It yeah. shifts your whole body. And mm -hmm. if, you're, if your port site is not numb, it's just as painful as sickle cell when it's being stuck into your chest two times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Zamora, let me um, build on what you said. So, you know, th thinking about that gentleman with the O negative blood, because even though he can give to anyone, he can only receive from someone else that's O negative. Right. So, you know, that's one reason why it was so hard to find. It's just, you know, there's not that many donors who are O negative giving blood. And that's why we need right. to to increase it. And it's not the hospital's fault. I mean, you clearly no. shared the hospital's thing, you know, like, cause well, they just didn't get, really this, they didn't get what yeah. they needed. Right. Hospitals they didn't get are what really they great needed. in this space where they will call other hospitals and try to, you know, get the blood that's needed. Yeah. Um, but that's why right. it's so important for um, people of, from a variety of backgrounds to give blood um, because we need that diversity. That's what makes our blood so precious. And it doesn't just help other Black folk. I mean, again, blood doesn't know race either. It just goes wherever. But the point is that, you know, yep, yep. Having that um, diversity is important. So Andrea, you wanted to hop in here. We were just following right. along. <laughs> I wanted you, after, if you make your comment, I also wanted you to address, we're talking about awareness, but I wanted you to address advocacy. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to get it out there for those of you who are sitting there saying, where can I give? Where can I give? If you are in Western Pennsylvania, I just want to say that we are having a blood drive on July 23rd, Sunday, July 23rd at Monroeville Pavilion um, from 11 to 4 p.m. So mm -hmm. I need all you who are listening out there <laughs> who can get to Monroeville Pavilion in Southwestern Pennsylvania. We would love to see you there. And we need a total of at least 40 people to give before the blood van will come. So mm -hmm. just if you need more information on that, please give me a call at 412-488-2723. That's 412-488-2723. And we'll be happy to put your name on the list so that you can help save a life. Every time you donate, you actually save three lives if you give a whole blood donation. So it is really important that you, um, you know, I felt that right in my heart that you can save lives with one donation. So please, you know, keep that in mind. 
the, when uh, Barbara was talking about advocacy, I literally was saying to myself, if we had more advocates, if people saw themselves as ambassadors and advocates, taking the information that you've learned tonight and telling one other person make, will make an impact. If you just say, hey, I was looking at this and, and I, I heard something that touched my heart. I, t I heard how I can get involved, how I can share the information, how I can get tested or call to find out what my, my, my trait status is. Something on this broadcast causes you, if something on this broadcast causes you to raise awareness in your own special way, everybody does it differently, but advocacy is so important. Your voice can change the world. So if you, you, you can be the voice for another family, what a sickle cell warrior, uh, a, you can be a, a advocate for all of us. So it doesn't take a lot. It just takes the willingness to listen, learn, and um, lift your voice with ours. So shining the light on sickle cell disease means lifting your voice, creating awareness, creating advocacy, um, and being a part of it. You can't sit back. This is not a spectator sport. <laughs> yeah, I love that. This is, um, you know, this is, we're all in, and we're all in for each other. And I think that that's really the beauty of Synergy um, Regional CBO um, and the, the connections that we've made, the strong connections all across the region. So there are blood drives going on all across the region. There are many, many signs. And when you see red this June 19th, I need you to think about sickle cell. I need you to tell somebody every time you see a building lit up, I need you to tell them what, what you learned to, today because that, that's a part of it. It's a small part of the story. Sickle cell is a big story, but take a small piece, the part that touched your heart and tell somebody when you see red on June 19th. Mm -hmm. or, and if, you, if, you can't, if you can't donate, you can volunteer. Yes, yes. That's important. Absolutely. Nika, you had something? Yeah, so this is not my blood drive, but I have a, a partnership agreement with the American Red Cross. But if you live in Prince George's County, Maryland, uh, PG, uh, PG Police will be having a blood drive. It's going to be held at the Police Services Complex, which is 7600 Barlow Road, Landover, Maryland, um, 20785. Um, the event is June 16th from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, you can register uh, by going to the American Red Cross uh, slash Our Blood. I was just looking at the drive and there are a lot of slots open. I would say probably maybe about 20 slots and the event is happening on Friday. So if you're in the DMV area, um, this is a part of battle of the police officers. Um, we ask you to uh, participate. And then also we, the DMV um, area will be partnering with the American Red Cross for Global Sickle Cell Awareness Day and the headquarters of the American Red Cross will be lit in red. And we are inviting sickle cell caregivers and sickle cell warriors um, to take the bus down with us. We have two locations. One is going to be at Largo Metro Center and the other one's going to be at Howard University slash Shaw Center. And so you'll be able to catch the bus from those locations, go downtown, take pictures and meet the American Red Cross staff. They're so excited to have everyone. Um, and then we'll hop on our buses and go back to our locations. And that will be our celebratory event for the DMV. Okay. And I do want to say that in Philadelphia, there's a radio um, um, host named E. Stephen Collins, who passed away many, many years ago. And we have the E. Stephen Collins Community Day of, of Giving. And there, there are blood drives that are listed from now until the end of September. So it must be about 50 blood drives that will be taking place. We work with, we have our regional coordinator, Laval Warren. She's a regional sickle cell coordinator who does all the blood drives for uh, Pennsylvania. I don't know, some of you may know her, I've worked with her before, but she's amazing. And so we've spent a lot of time talking about donating, but also about awareness, the importance of awareness and what you can do to make a difference. We're all doing a number of events for Shine the Light. I mean, I heard about a biker's run, uh, you know, a walkathon, the blood drive. Um, 
of one of our partners in Virginia. She has a billboard on the highway talking about shine the light on sickle cell. There's a number of events. Maybe others can chime in with what they're doing for shine the light. And, and if you're interested, the hashtag is hashtag shine the light on sickle cell. If you want to know more, you can go to the um, uh, William E. Proudford um, Fund website, look for Synergy, click on that, and then you'll see Shine the Light. You click on that. It has all the information that you need to get involved. So in Philadelphia, we have 19 buildings that will be lit up in red. One of the buildings, the top of it is like you're in New York in Times Square. It will be uh, on their digital billboard. So it's a number of things that are going on in Philadelphia. That's just one of many. And perhaps Andrea, Tanika, and Barbara can share what they're doing for Shine the Light. Sure, we have um, some of our buildings in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania lit up. It's the Children's Hospital rooftop, the Golf Tower, the Cup, uh, Cooper's Building, the David O. Lawrence Convention Center, and the city county building will all be lit up. And in Harrisburg, which is one of our partner cities, uh, we have the Capitol building. Um, it, the lieutenant governor's windows will be lit up. So we're really excited this year because we got um, we had a wonderful community health worker who worked tirelessly to make sure that she was using the information that is on the Synergy website. Um, there is a um, host of information about how you can shine the light. So if you're interested in doing something, it's not too late. Go, go on, find the ideas, and make sure that you are um, ready to shine the light on sickle cell this, this June 19th. Um, Ms. Barbara? Yeah, so, um, so Howard University will be having um, its annual World Sickle Cell Day event. Um, we are virtual this year, um, and it will be on Friday, June 16th, uh, from 3 to 5 p.m. And so our theme is Warriors in Advocacy and in the Workplace. And so we're going to be joined by some great warriors sharing their inspirational stories and instructive stories and giving um, advice um, to others who want to be more involved with advocacy and those that are just, yeah, I just say, like regular folks just trying to live day by day, hold their jobs, um, and some of the challenges and su successes that they have had as well, um, again, as an encouragement and inspiration to others. Um, and many of you um, know that our president, President Wayne A.I. Frederick um, at Howard University is a sickle cell warrior himself. Um, he will be retiring from that post in July, so we're going to be acknowledging him. Um, he's doing well, his health is fine, but you know, it's just that time has come. Um, and so we um, are really looking forward to that event. So if you go to any of our social media, HU Sickle Cell, um, you should be able to find information about that event and be able to sign up. And I'm going to punt it over to Tanika again. Yes, it's very exciting. So we will have several landmarks lit um, in the DMV area. First of all, the governor's mansion um, at the Capitol um, in our great state of Maryland will be lit in red in honor of Global um, Sickle Cell Awareness Day and shine the light for sickle cell. As mentioned already, um, the American Red Cross headquarters will also uh, be lit in red. And we will have a host of events throughout the DMV as Barbara had mentioned. And we're just really excited. You know, sickle cell is one of those diseases where it's not talked about a lot. You know, light isn't really, you know, shown on the disease or the people who live with the disease. And they're the, one of the most, some of the most resilient individuals um, that I ever met. And sickle cell warriors are fighters and they're deserving of, you know, having their disease upholded and uplifted just like cancer or HIV or any other illness that individuals live with that gets a lot more spotlight um, than sickle cell. So we just ask that you are partner with your local community, your local sickle cell community and let sickle cell 
warriors know that they're special too. Um, a lot of our warriors struggle. And one of the reasons why I wanted to create this event is because it'll be a social event. Um, a lot of our warriors, especially our younger ones and our young adults, they deal with depression and loneliness and anxiety. The pain is so excruciating that they deal with. I like to tell people who ask me, what does a simple cell crisis feel like? Let's, let's take your finger and slam it in a car door and repeatedly slam that car door in your finger. That is what a sickle cell crisis feels like. It's one of the most painful things um, known to man. And so patients live with this disease their entire lives and they struggle. And especially when they get into the adult world, they're not believed. They're told they're liars. They told they're drug addicts, they're drug seeking. They get kicked out of hospitals and police called on them and they just really have a disease. And so a lot of mental health um, issues and challenges comes about when you're dealing with such pain and being ignored by your medical community. And so I really wanted to give our warriors in the DMV an opportunity just to have fun and not have to think about their disease for once and just celebrate. And everyone else in our country who's celebrating um, Global Sickle Cell Day and Shine the Light on Sickle Cell um, as our marketing campaign that you know people will be able to understand and see sickle cell warriors um, for the amazing and resilient people that they are. Why, well, thank you. I think that kind of brings us to a close. Um, we're not sure what happened with Marsha, but apparently, you know, the spirit is with us that we've just been able to talk and have conversation like we've never had before. This is so important. So I just want to first say thank you to Tanika Hoffman, our, our young progressive warrior, sickle cell warrior, who is, uh, this is who we're passing the baton on to. These, these young people like this, because we've been in this for a long, long time. I mean, I've been doing it for like 40 years, you know? <laughs> and so we're looking for those young, those young millennials coming behind us to be able to step up and take it to the next level. I wanna say thank you so much to Barbara Harrison. I did not know until this time that you were a genetic counselor. Barbara, but you have provided great insight and wisdom about sickle cell disease. Thank you so much. And uh, my sister queen, Andrea Matthews, thank you. We're always doing things together somehow, some way. And uh, I just want to thank you. I know you're getting ready to travel and this is getting late into the evening, but I just want to say thank you. And thank you to Marsha. We're not sure what may have happened with her technical, we had some technical difficulties early on. Some people couldn't even get on to watch this, you know. Oh. So there's some things going on, but we just want to say thank you. Remember to shine the light, not just on June 19th, which we all know is Juneteenth, but shine the light every day, everywhere you can, everywhere you go, shine the light. And don't forget September is National Sickle Cell Awareness Month. Don't forget in October will be the first in-person slash virtual um, SCDA National Convention in Arlington, Virginia. I want to say thanks, a special thanks to Dr. Karen Proudford, our fearless leader. We wouldn't be doing any of this if it wasn't for her leadership. And thank you to Stephen Rivelis and Karen Beyer for their participation and all the other people that are leaders under Synergy, those that are leading the unaffiliated patients community, the data collection, the onboarding, um, the ECHO committee. Those are all the committees that are involved under the umbrella of Shine the Light. So we say thank you. If you have any questions, we're with the Sickle Cell Disease Association, Philadelphia, Delaware Valley chapter. Barbara, you are with the Howard, Howard University sickle cell program. Tanique is with the Sickle Cell Coalition of Maryland. Is that right? And Andrea is with the Children's Sickle Cell Foundation. So we just say thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll have to do this again with Marsha. We have an open invitation now so we can come back on. Thank you, thank everyone. Thank you, Zamoria, for your leadership. Thank you. We appreciate you. Okay, take care. Bye -bye. Thank bye -bye. you, everyone. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.